Here's a question. How does someone become a Christian? I wonder how you'd answer that. It's one of the most important questions there's going, even though people might not think it's very relevant. A person isn't a Christian just because they call themselves a Christian. Just like I'm, I'm not a phlebotomist, even if I claim to be a phlebotomist. And if you've got a needle out, I'll be on the floor the moment I saw it. You can't just call yourself some, something and assume <coughs> that is your identity. A Christian is more than that. A Christian is someone who has owned up to God about the evil that's in them and has confessed that they don't have the solution in themselves for that evil. They rely on Jesus and him alone to forgive them, relying on his death, his resurrection to rescue them from the evil that's in them and outside of them, relying on him to make them new. That is what a true Christian is. And all this is summarised in the simple phrase, to follow Jesus. If you follow Jesus, then all of what I've said about what a Christian truly is, is bound up in that. To follow Jesus means to leave the old life behind and walk each day with Jesus. So it's worth saying that being born in a so-called Christian country doesn't make you a Christian. Neither does being born to Christian parents. This is a change that happens in someone's life. I confessed in a sermon a while ago of maybe the stupidest thing I've ever done, which was turning the wrong way onto a dual carriageway, in a car, obviously. I was driving a car, I turned onto a dual carriageway in the wrong direction. And what did I have to do? I had to stop. I had to realise I'm doing this all wrong and it's dangerous. I must stop and turn around and head in the right direction. And that's kind of like what it is to become a Christian, to realise I'm going in a wrong and dangerous direction. I need to stop, turn around and go in the right direction. And let's acknowledge for a moment that the living God loves diversity. I know it's a bit of a gear shift there. But think about that. God loves diversity. He hasn't made just one creature and all that one creature the same. He's made a multitude, countless creatures in this world, even the stars, though they might look similar to us. They are vastly different if you look at them through a microscope. God loves diversity. He is the creative creator, you could say. He loves doing new things. We see that displayed in the world, the variety that he loves, and we see it throughout the scriptures as well, how Jesus delights in doing something new, something surprising. He won't just res rescue his people in the same way each and every time. One time he sends a David, another time he sends a Gideon, one time he sends a Moses, another time he sends a child. Sometimes he sends an angel. There are so many stories of how Jesus has rescued his people. He loves to do something new. He loves diversity, variety. We see that in church as well. You just have to look around and we're not all the same. We're not made the same, but once we trust in Jesus, we're not the same. We don't have the same gifts, although we're filled with the same spirit. And the way in which we begin to follow Jesus or how we become a Christian isn't the same. We've got different stories and that is wonderful news. It is true that all who believe in Jesus have had the Holy Spirit working in their heart. It's a miracle. He highlights the sin in us and he draws us to the Saviour and he gives that vital gift of faith. And yet, how this plays out in each individual's experience of coming to faith is as unique as the person themselves. So if we were to go around the room, it would take quite a little while, and ask each and every one of us, what's our story of coming to faith? Then there would be no two stories the same. Of course there'll be similarities but I think there'll be far more differences. For some it would have been hearing someone else's story of faith for the first time that was crucial. For others it was experiencing the love and the joy and the peace among the church that would be key. For some it would be hitting rock bottom in life and the Lord used that to open their eyes. For some it's that emptiness of their existence without Jesus. For some, it was like switching on the lights in a dark room, instantaneous. For others, it was more like the gradual dawning of the sun. And the list would go on and on and on. So many different wonderful ways of coming to faith. Every person must be brought to new life in Jesus by the same Spirit 
They believe the same gospel, cling to the same cross, clothed in the same righteousness, given the same hope of glory. And yet, none of our stories are going to be identical. And in this morning's passage, in John chapter 1, we meet the first five disciples called by Jesus. And it's the beginning of their story of faith, how they first follow Jesus, how they become a Christian. And for those five disciples, there are four distinct ways in which it happens. We might not get a comprehensive answer to how someone becomes a Christian, but we can answer how did these five men begin following the author of life. So firstly, in verses 35 to 39, we meet two of John the Baptist's disciples. We find out that one of them is called Andrew, and that's Simon Peter's brother, but the other's name is left a mystery. The nameless disciple is most likely John. If you read John's Gospel, you probably know why I say this, because he liked to leave his name out of things. He refers to himself as the other disciple, or the disciple whom Jesus loved. So he doesn't put this disciple's name here, probably because it's John himself, the author of this Gospel account. So let's assume that this is John's own personal story, first becoming a follower of Jesus, along with Andrew, his fisherman friend, and what was it that connected them to Christ? Well, they were already disciples of John the Baptist, as we said, and one day they heard John the Baptist preach one of the shortest, yet most powerful sermons ever. Verse 36, when he saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. Shortest sermon, maybe the most powerful sermon ever preached. And I'll let you in on a secret. I take great comfort in the fact that the day before this, the incredibly gifted John the Baptist had already said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And he pointed to Jesus. Jesus was there again. And nothing seemingly happened. I used to stress about saying exactly the right thing to a person when chatting about Jesus, as if there was a spe special, specific set of words that I could say and it would all make sense to them, that they would get it instantly. But people didn't instantly get it when they had perhaps the greatest preacher preaching the simplest sermon with Jesus physically, literally right there, and all with seemingly no effect. And I take comfort in the fact that that happened. It's an encouragement to me as I speak in church and through the week to you, and also an encouragement to you as you chat with friends and family about the Lord to simply keep on pointing to Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Eventually, in God's time, by sheer grace, he will call those to himself. People will run to Jesus. Maybe there is someone here who has heard it a thousand times before and still hasn't come to Jesus themselves. So, let me say it again, as John the Baptist said the next day, the same message. Look to Jesus, the Lamb of God, who's died to save you and is alive today. You can have life in his name. Well, the passage goes on to tell us that John and Andrew began to follow Jesus, but they weren't his disciples as yet. They were sincerely searching. Jesus turned round and looked at the two of them and asked, what do you want? In this translation, it sounds a bit abrupt. What do you want? <laughs> I wonder how Jesus said this. Well, that's how it's translated in the NIV. But more accurately, Jesus asked them, what are you searching for? I always find it amazing when Jesus asks questions, because he surely knows the answer already. So he asks us questions to invite us into a conversation. Let that question that Jesus asks Andrew and John ask you today. What are you searching for? How would you answer that? We're all looking for something, aren't we? Well, in response, they ask Jesus where he's staying, and Jesus invites them to come and see. We're not told where it was, what they saw, or what was said, but they spent the day with him. And by the end of it, they became convinced that Jesus is the Messiah. 
People have got all sorts of questions about the existence of God and Christianity, and there are good answers to the all, all of them. And sometimes it can be helpful for us to think through all this. Nevertheless, there isn't a written exam to get into heaven. The Apostle Peter isn't there with a checklist, with a list of questions and set answers. The basis on which anyone spends eternity with Jesus is whether or not they actually know Jesus. It's about knowing him. And so I'm inclined to say that if Jesus is alive and is who he says he is, then you can come to him today with all your questions, with all your doubts. If he's there, why don't you bring your questions to him? Come and see, in other words. Spend time with him. Jesus is Lord. Creation's voice proclaims it. Jesus has promised to be present with his disciples as we gather in his name. And we can encounter him by reading the Bible. We can speak to him in prayer. We can be with Jesus. And we can find the one that we've been searching for. So how does someone become a Christian? Well, John and Andrew heard John the Baptist's message, spent time with Jesus, and they ended up following Jesus all of their days. The next disciple, or the disciple to be, has a different story, but connected. We're told that the first thing Andrew did was to go find his brother Simon and told him, we found the Messiah. Good news is hard to keep a secret, isn't it? especially when it involves new life. So if there's a newborn baby in the family, you want to get the pictures out. You want to show everyone down the post office, down the pub. You want to put it on Facebook. You want everyone to see that there is new life. And it's particularly hard for children to keep surprises as well. It was my birthday last week and my girls just couldn't wait to tell me all the things that they got planned. <laughs> they were bursting with it. And so it seems to be with people who are born again, these newborn infants, children of the living God, they are so often eager to share not just good news, but the best news ever, that Jesus is the saviour. He's come to rescue me and he's come to rescue you and you can know him. It's often the people who get it for the first time, who want everyone to know, and that was certainly true of Andrew. So he went to his brother, Simon, and he brought him to Jesus. And Jesus looks at Simon. And just how I'd like to know how Jesus said, what are you searching for? I'd like to know what kind of look Jesus gave Simon in this moment. He looks at Simon and he says, you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas. And Cephas, we're told, is Peter. And that translates as Rocky. Hey, Rocky, that was Peter. <laughs> Now, there's a lot said these days about self-discovery, isn't there? We ask little ones, when they can barely talk, what do you want to be when you're older? We grow up, we try to figure out who we are. Maybe we go travelling, thinking that we'll find ourselves at the top of Kilimanjaro. People are desperately seeking who I am, what I'm for, what life is about. <clears throat> so maybe we move house, we move job with this unrestlessness inside us still not knowing who we really are. Well, with Andrew's help, Simon discovers Jesus, and by discovering Jesus, he discovers who he truly is. Jesus knows Simon far better than Simon knows himself. This is your name. In other words, this is who you are, and this is your new name in my book. You are called Simon. You will be called Peter. So the invitation is there for us. Come and follow Jesus and he'll make sense of your life. The secret of self-discovery is discovering Jesus. He teaches us that our life is worth more than the world. That we are loved by God more than we could ever know. That our lives have a purpose and that we are precious. So how does someone become a Christian? Well, Andrew introduced Simon to Jesus and Jesus introduced Simon to Peter the man God calls him to be. The next person to become a follower in our passage is Philip, who doesn't respond to a public message or a personal invitation. 
but this time he's called directly by Jesus. Verse 43 says that the next day Jesus decided to leave for Galilee, but before he had before he could go, he had an important appointment to make. He was heading to Galilee, but just wait, got to do something. He went and found Philip. And he simply says, follow me. It's worth remembering that Jesus is God the Son. He didn't need John the Baptist to point John and Andrew in his direction. Jesus didn't need Andrew to bring Simon Peter to him. He was more than capable in countless ways to reveal himself to the entire world. He's God. He can do that. And yet he has chosen to show off his power in our weakness. He sends us out to share the good news. It's a privilege for us to work alongside him in this way. It might seem bizarre to us. We might shy away from it like Moses and suggest Jesus save the world another way because we're rubbish at getting the message across. Don't rely on us, Jesus. What are you thinking? And yet we are the chosen instrument, the channel of broadcasting the good news. And we have the confidence of knowing that as we speak to people about our Lord, he will speak through us. So in a sense, Jesus' voice was heard by Andrew and John in the voice of John the Baptist. And Simon Peter heard Jesus' voice in his brother Andrew's excited news. And yet, there are exceptional times when Jesus chooses to speak directly to a person. He can do that. He's God. The Apostle Paul had heard the testimony of Stephen whilst he was holding the coats of those who were stoning him to death. They heard this powerful message of hope, even in the face of death. And yet it was while Paul was on his way to Damascus that Jesus confronted him with this overwhelming glory, directly. In the Middle East, in countries where the governments are violently against Christianity and make it difficult to get the message of Jesus to people, there have been many, many people who have had dreams and visions of the Lord Jesus. He's got through to them in that way. He's not limited. And even when it is humanly impossible, he makes a way. And many people have had that kind of experience in countries like Iran. Likewise, there are many people in Wales who have heard the voice of Jesus calling them directly. And a good friend of mine was high on drugs and the Lord showed him hell. He's very blunt about it. He was off his face and he was given this awful vision of hell. But that was exactly the wake-up call that Jesus knew that he needed. There are those who earnestly seek Jesus and are surprised to discover that Jesus is seeking them. But there are also those who can give a monkeys about Jesus or church or Christianity, but Jesus stops them in their tracks. He's able to do that with anyone. He calls them out of darkness and into his marvellous light. So how does someone become a Christian? Well, Philip heard Jesus' voice saying, follow me. And he did. Now the fifth disciple we meet in our passage is Nathaniel. His experience of becoming a disciple is different again to the others although there are similarities. Like Andrew, Philip's first instinct was to share the good news, so he went and found Nathanael and said these amazing words. We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. <coughs> but unlike Simon Peter, who went along with his brother, Nathanael needed more persuading. It's funny what he says. Nazareth? <laughs> Can anything good come from there? It's so relatable, isn't it? That is us down to a T. But to be fair to Nathaniel, to hear your friend claiming they just met God in the flesh is probably a bit unexpected, isn't it? And then to have this unparalleled, glorious claim that the promised Messiah is here, but then coupled with the pretty boring information that it's Jesus the common name of Nazareth, a bit of a dump, up north. <laughs> he's the son of Joseph, he's the carpenter. It's this strange mix of the extraordinary and the ordinary. It's a bit like me saying, the Messiah is Keith from Grimsby. No offence to Grimsby. But that's how it would have been heard. 
He's understandably sceptical. But Philip doesn't get the scriptures out to argue the case for Nazareth or explain Joseph's ancestry, how he's the descendant of King David and all the promises bound up in that. He doesn't enter into a debate. G Philip simply says, come and see. Come and see. Yeah, you've got questions. Yeah, you've got doubts. Just come and see. The sceptic comes with his questions and Jesus himself proves himself to Nathaniel. In a similar way to Simon Peter, Jesus tells Nathanael who Nathanael truly is. Verse 47, when Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, here truly is an Israelite in whom is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. He is clearly a person who's dedicated to being honest, a person of integrity. He works hard at it. He prides himself in it. And Jesus put his finger on that element of his character. And in an instant, Nathanael knew that Jesus knew him. How do you know me? Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Again, our journey of self-discovery only truly ends by discovering Jesus. If you want to know who you are, you need to find out who, who Jesus is. So how does someone become a Christian? Well, Nathaniel was told about Jesus by Philip, but only acknowledged that Jesus is the Son of God, the King of Israel, when Jesus personally dealt with his doubts. These first five disciples came to faith in four different ways. Jesus is like a great artist. I don't know whether you've been to the craft shop recently and looked at the beautiful paintings. And there's so much variety on show. Jesus is like a great artist. He isn't limited to painting the same picture over and over. He's free, he's expressive, he's effective, expertly working unique masterpieces of grace in the lives of all those who come to him. Therefore, don't be worried if your experience of first following Jesus isn't like the person you've listened to on YouTube. It's not that heart-wrenching testimony of how someone fell into using drugs and abusing alcohol and their whole lives got turned upside down. If that's not you, you don't have to worry, don't be concerned. If your testimony isn't the same as these five disciples, what is really important is whether or not you have come to Jesus, whether you have committed your life to following him, depending on him now, then you are his and he is yours that you are safe in his care. Whether there was one moment that you can pinpoint as the turning point, or whether it's messy or blurry than that, it doesn't matter. If you believe in Jesus, you are promised eternal life. Maybe today is a significant day for someone here when the adventure begins. Because when we first come to Jesus and commit to following him, it really is a beginning of an adventure. As Jesus says to Nathaniel at the end of the chapter, you believe because I told you, I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than that. In other words, Jesus says, just wait. The best is yet to come. This is just the beginning. You'll see and experience blessings pour down from heaven in a way that you thought were impossible. You just wait. If coming to Christ is awe-inspiring, then what will the rest of your life be like? following him. How do you become a Christian? Well, here are some stories 